The transition to clerkship is a significant one, and for many students, is one of the biggest challenges of med school. This is because as a clerk, you are called upon to master several domains of knowledge and skills all at once, and to do so in an ever-changing environment. These core learning priorities include content acquisition, activities related to patient care, role expectations and membership on the health care team, communication and interpersonal skills, managing these demands, understanding pathophysiology, recognizing acronyms, performing clinical interviews, giving case presentations, all while in the context of the dizzying medical system is incredibly difficult. Let's face it, it's hard to focus your attention when so much is going on around you. Really know your patient while learning as much as you can and navigate the complexities of the hospital setting and the culture of each rotation. Very early in my own clerkship, I found it extremely difficult to understand my role, know when to talk and ask for feedback or clarification, and want to keep quiet and not disrupt the workflow. For me, this challenge existed because it was never explained to me how much was expected of me, especially compared to the other students and residents on the team. I didn't know how much I could move those boundaries or how to structure my learning. I needed help managing this, recognizing what re learning opportunities were available to me and capitalizing on them when I could. Now that you're about to start your first clerkship, similar questions are likely surfacing about what will be expected of you, what you'll be required to know, and in general, what each day will entail. We've developed this video with that in mind, describing a typical day on the ward in medicine and ways to benefit from the myriad learning opportunities available to you. As we describe a typical day, what to do and what to pay attention to, keep in mind that every rotation follows a different schedule. This may go without saying, but make sure you know the specific schedule of your rotation before your first day. So what can you expect during the clerkship? Most of the action on wards take place between 6 a.m. and 1 p.m., so expect to be on point as soon as you get there. But what are you supposed to do? Who are you supposed to see? When you arrive at the hospital, the first thing you'll need to do is get a sign out on your patients. You usually have two to three from your intern or the overnight resident. One helpful tip is to check with your intern beforehand about when he or she will be arriving that morning. That way, the two of you can get sign out from the resident together and begin to plan for the day. You'll want to carefully review these forms because a lot can happen to your patients over the course of one night. And get ready because information processing and synthesis begins here and now. A few critical questions should guide your learning as you review these notes. For example, you should be thinking, what happened to my patients overnight? What information does this give me? What information do I need to seek out in light of data gathered? Answers to these questions should guide the next part of your day, pre-rounding, which can be helpful to think of as a three-step process. One, pre-rounding begins by seeking out information about your patient on your own. First, you'll want to access EHR, get morning lab results, follow up on pending microbiology or radiology results, Check to see what notes were made from consults or other team members and look at overnight vitals. And go talk to your patient's nurse or nurses to see if there's anything you should know about. Yes, it's true you'll want to gather as much information as you can for purposes of your presentation, but you should remember to have an eye towards your own learning. It's easy to forget that the clerkship experience is applied experiential learning, especially as you're collecting information, but it is. So just as before, there are several questions you can ask yourself to help synthesize the material. Think about the following. What information is most relevant to my patient? Does the information tell me something new about my patient that I didn't already know? If so, what? Write it down. How does the information gathered link into what I already know about my patient and or the disease my patient presents with. What, if any, actions do I need to take? Once you've thought about these questions and gathered as much information as you can, it's time to see your patients, the second step of the pre-rounding process. You should remember that every encounter with your patient should serve a directed purpose. 
a purpose that you should be able to explicitly identify. For example, if you discovered that your patient's LFTs were abnormal, elevated AST and ALT levels in your chart review, a couple questions may come to mind like, is this a reaction to a medication? Does the patient have hepatic disease? Would that make sense given the patient's history? Does he or she have a history of alcoholism, poor nutrition, or risky sexual behavior? Do you know? Do you need to ask? Think about and generate these types of questions as a way to guide your interaction with your patients. Such questions help clarify what you need to learn from them and help determine what tests have yet to be performed. Furthermore, they help inform your own learning. Figuring out what questions need answers and why is always a useful exercise in clinical reasoning. Now, with your plan for the patient encounter developed, you can begin your physical exam. This should be brief and directed. And remember, includes a review of the four basic systems and any other systems relevant for that patient. You might want to begin your exam with a simple statement such as, how are you feeling this morning? Or you could ask your patient what his or her goals are for the day. If you need to check vitals, now's the time. Once you've gathered all the information, you can prepare your presentation for rounds. This is the critical third step of the pre-rounding process that helps to integrate all the information you've gathered from the morning and the previous day's events. Your presentation should be prepared in the ESOAP format. We know you've seen this before, but let's review. E is for events overnight. S is for subjective. How is the patient doing this morning and what are the patient's goals for the day? O is for objective. Vitals, labs, cultures, and film images. A is for assessment. What's the big picture? It answers the question, what's going on with my patient? And addresses each problem on the problem list. P is for plan. Inpatient management and treatment for each problem, along with discharge plans and transitioning care. Here, take advantage of up-to-date Health Stream or PubMed. Ultimately, your team wants to hear your assessment or the big picture of what's going on with your patient. This could include the one-liner, what brought him or her to the hospital, active issues, and should incorporate the patient's trajectory. For example, Is the patient worsening, stable, or improving? It can be useful, too, to think of each of the patient's major problems as requiring its own assessment and plan. Moreover, it helps to organize your plans into diagnostic and therapeutic measures, if applicable. For example, if your patient had abdominal pain and was vomiting and not passing stools, your plan might include a KUB, for diagnoses and an NG tube for decompressive therapy. A strategy such as this is extremely helpful for breaking down what are often complex problems requiring multiple forms of intervention. Your presentation should also include any agreed upon discharge goals including the patient's plan for follow-up with outpatient providers. Remember that ultimately your role as a provider is to ensure a safe transition out of the hospital. So always keep discharge planning in mind. Practice your presentations beforehand if you need to, and be sure to connect with the residents to ask any questions. In order to be efficient and make the most out of this process, you'll also want to think about what your attending will want to hear. The answer to this will depend largely on the attending himself or herself, so you should know as much as you can in advance about what he or she expects from you. More than anything else, this was by far the best advice I ever received from fellow clerks. Having an expectations discussion with your attending and the residents at the beginning of every single clerkship. Such conversations are critical to your success and sanity. Ask them what their preferences are during rounds, whether they're open to question asking and what they'd like to see from you. Establish a plan and time for feedback and evaluation too, so you can adjust your approach as necessary. Not all attendings and residents will remember to meet with you individually, so you'll have to be proactive about initiating these discussions. Yes, it's hard to do, but it is possible and important. You'll also want to come up with your own list of goals for each clerkship and present these to your resident and attending. 
This will help them understand your priorities so they can focus their teaching and feedback to your needs too, and any good attending will do this. So what happens next? You've pre-rounded, prepared your presentation, and now it's time for rounds. During rounds, the whole team gathers together and visits all the patients on the ward. In most cases, team members will include the attending, one or two senior residents, and an intern, a first-year resident, along with any other allied health professionals such as nurses, social workers, or nutritionists. In addition to presenting your plans for your patient to your team during rounds, you'll also want to listen carefully to the presentations made by others, with an eye and ear towards learning as much as you can. It's true that rounds provide one of the best platforms to learn clinical information and skills, so you should definitely seize these opportunities. Pay attention to team dynamics and bedside manner. Ask yourself, are the team leaders practicing humanistic care? Are they listening to their patients, taking their preferences and values into consideration? Do they know how their patients are managing their illnesses and whether they have the resources and support to do so once they're discharged? And think about how the answers to these questions inform your own style with patients. Remember that you can learn a great deal about the kind of doctor you want to be through observation and critical reflection on your experiences. And yes, you're building your professional identity right now. Although this should go without saying, when presenting patient information to your team, only convey the factual information that you know for certain. Communication of misinformation can prove dangerous. If you don't know something, for example, a patient's hemoglobin or creatinine, say, I don't know, but I will find out. This will be respected by the entire team. Now what? Take a deep breath, go get lunch, and go to noon conference. Most afternoons present a good opportunity to engage in independent learning and to enhance strategies related to reading, clinical note-taking, and patient care. This can include finalizing notes for patients, making sure orders are in, following up on any test results for morning orders, calling consulting teams, visiting patients to check in, provide updates, or gather more information. After noon conference, the first thing I did was check in with my residents and interns to see if there was any way I could be helpful. This often entailed following up on issues discussed on rounds or tracking down information from outside hospitals or care providers. Some attendings like to see patients on their own after team rounds, so I also checked to see what they were doing and tagged along, if they let me which provided invaluable learning opportunities. In short, it helps to be around and involved in patient care as much as you can, even if just as a bystander. In the afternoon, you'll also have a chance to read more about your patient's illnesses and or study general information for your shelf exam. Which of these to focus on can be a bit of a challenge to figure out, but in general, you should always make sure to know about each of the issues on your patient's problem list and understand as much as you can about any medications they are taking, the tests being performed, and why. The goal here is not only to provide the best patient care, but also to learn and make connections between key concepts. One way to do this is to structure your reading of clinical concepts horizontally rather than vertically. What do I mean by this? Well, there are two general ways to read and take notes on clinical issues, vertically and horizontally. Vertical reading focuses on the disease in isolation, usually without a framework. For instance, if your patient has liver disease, you would look for journal articles, book chapters, etc. on liver disease. This type of reading is necessary and important. It helps build the foundation of knowledge and provides an overarching framework from which to understand disease processes. Horizontal reading is not disease-driven, but syndrome-driven. Organizing information in this way is extremely useful because it reflects the way knowledge, data, and information is used in the clinical environment. In almost every case, your own clinical knowledge will be pulled forth based on the patient presentation, not the disease. Organizing information in this way 
starting with the syndrome and then looking at the diseases that cause such conditions help build knowledge and store info in a way that allows for comparison across diseases. This aids in the development of a differential when another patient presents with the same symptom. In short, this form of learning and reading allows for conceptualization of disease processes. Even if you're well into reading or studying, by 3 p.m. it will be time to shift gears again. From 3 to 4, you can expect to take part in didactics with other students on the rotation. Oftentimes, these sessions are geared towards learning goals for third years, so take notes and listen. If you know you learn best by teaching others, you may want to take advantage of this opportunity and request to lead a session. Even though your learning may not be the first priority on words, you can make it one during these sessions. Focus on your needs, interests, and learning goals. Give a presentation on a topic of interest to you. This is the time and the place. On most rotations, if you're not on call, by 4 p.m., your day will be nearing its end. So what should you do when this time has come? First, check in with your intern again. What tasks can you help with? Is there any work lingering from the morning or any new test results requiring more follow-up? Also, have you seen your patients since morning rounds? If not, go visit them, ask them how they're feeling, and see if they have any questions about the day's events. Let them know that you're leaving for the day, but will return the next day to see them. When all your work is done for the day and you're permitted to leave, leave. You don't get bonus points for staying after your team dismisses you. When you get home, you may want to review your notes and look up answers to any questions you had. If there's information that can help you refine your assessment or plan for your patient, look that up too. It will save you valuable time the next morning. In the often stressful and chaotic environment of clerkships, it's easy to focus on the fact that there's so much to accomplish in what may seem like a limited amount of time. From 6 a.m. onwards, you will find yourself engaged in complex and simultaneous processes of data gathering, information processing, and skill building. You will be called upon to deliver well-informed, evidence-based care to your patient, establish your role as a member of the healthcare team, and honor your position in the hierarchy, all while navigating a new and unfamiliar system. We know the job is far from easy, but we also know it can be done. Approaching the clerkship with a sense of dedication, flexibility, and initiative can help you capitalize on the rich and varied experiences available to you and help to maximize your learning.